The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! You think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? Well, I mustn't have been paying attention. When you were just talking to me Do you think that you could repeat the question? And I listen more attentively There must have been something I got nothing on my page that nothing that wasn't quite so easy to see And I must have missed something When you were just talking to me that's all we got all right i thought we had, thought we had a couple more seconds uh hi how you guys doing good good glad to hear it you in the blue car fantastic this is the paying attention podcast here on uh the uh here at high atop uh, two guys smoke shop at studio 21 oh, podcast okay. cafe what's that paul you mumbling I, I just, while i'm talking i just wonder i wonder how many people in blue cars are I listening wonder. to us right you know now. what i wonder i wonder why he has to do that <laughs> while i'm talking i'm just wondering that that's what i wonder. i wonder a lot of things i know you do and yeah. it, 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 i could be talking about the most important thing how many the, people if you're in the history of man but if i car Give us a call. But if I make one one silly reference, that's what he focuses on. The least important thing of what I say is what Paul has to focus on. Uh, you're not saying anything important. All right. Thanks for coming, kids. Good night. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. Go on with your introduction nonsense. Uh, whatever. All right. Thanks for coming. We're here at the, uh, what, do the what do you call this place? The smoke, uh, the two guys smoke shop. Uh, the, yeah, the High smoke above. Thing. High above the two guys smoke shop. Yep. That's and, how it works. What's it called? What do we call this? Yeah, this is the Paying Attention Radio Program with Tom Duggan. No, I mean, what do you call the studio? And it is the, uh, the, the studio. It's called the studio up there in the high... It is the Something Studio. It's right there. It's what the Something Studio. That's pretty good. Yeah. Dave, Welcome to the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. You are here with us today on this wonderful, incredible day that Tom is going to have a magnificent show. Well, let's not, let's not raise their expectations too high because it's probably going to suck. But mm. um, we have a lot of things to talk about today. We had elections in Massachusetts, across the country. Yesterday, was it yesterday? To me, it's yesterday. Day before? Day before yesterday. Uh, what a crazy <laughs> week. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Usually when you think about yesterday, it's, pr- it's usually the day before. Yeah, because, yeah. I, don't, because I don't sleep. So like you I, look it by the way. We you, had, you, don't, you don't look too healthy. Thank today. I don't feel too healthy today. Mm. Um, so the, we, we put the paper. Normally we put the paper out on a Tuesday, okay. right? That's the yeah. day that the printer can get us on. And then when there are days like uh, on election days, which always happen on a Tuesday, the printer will make room for us on a Thursday at some point during the day. But our, yeah. we're a monthly paper, and our printer usually only does weekly papers. Yeah. So he has to kind of squeeze us in in between jobs if we don't come in at, at the exact uh, like regular time on a Tuesday at 5 a.m. Okay. So we had the long weekend, which was Labor Day weekend, and then, of course, Election Day, the day after Labor Day, and then, of course, now I'm on deadline to print on 5 a.m. Thursday morning, which is this morning, so I haven't really had much sleep. I've been, oh. up, I've been up for about three days with wow. maybe a total of six hours sleep That's in between horrible. all of that. I That's know. That's horrible. I know, but I'm used to it now. It's just my, my body's used to it. Just my brain's still trying to catch up on everything. So we put out our paper this morning. We posted it online. That it's physically being printed as we speak. At uh, Graphic Development in Hanover, Massachusetts, that's uh, uh, our good friend Bill Samatis and Bob Damon. We have been with them. Uh, we started the Valley Patriot. Our first edition was in March of 2004, and we have been with Graphic Development in Hanover, Massachusetts, since 2004. They've been our printer ever since, and uh, they do a great job. They always, I mean, even like if there are times when I'll send the paper in at like 4 a.m. And then I'll crash because I've been up for two or three days. And then they'll call me and say, Tom, we've got a problem with one of the pictures or we've got a problem with you know, one of the pages didn't come in right. Uh, That's what you want to hear. But don't worry about it, Tom. Hmm. We took care of it on our end. Oh, and, and then you, I can roll trust back. them. Oh, and they've yeah. done a fantastic job for almost 15 years, so we appreciate them. I also want to say hi to Dawn at Dawn's Sign Tech in North Andover. She, uh, she makes signs f- mostly for businesses, and um, she's been really helpful with our legal defense fund hmm. uh, in our lawsuit against uh, Mathurin Mayor Jim Jajuga. Uh, she's one of the few people that... Um, She's one of the few people that gave a donation that didn't say, please, please conceal my identity. I don't, you know, I'm worried about retaliation. So she actually said we could thank her. So we want to thank her for that. We had 
Well, Tom, I didn't conceal my identity either when I made my donation. Right. Uh, Ed made a, 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 an $8,000 donation. Is that, that what that was? A little, little less. We're still waiting for the check to clear, though, I think. <laughs> it's PayPal. It's already there. Right, right. So we had all kinds of elections yesterday, Paul. We'll, 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 I'll ask you where you want to go. We have, we have election results and stuff, right, about the election. In Massachusetts? Is that uh, what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, okay. Massachusetts and you know, kind of nationwide, but we won't right. focus on Mass. Uh, we have the Kavanaugh hearing for the state's... For the United States Supreme Court, which is probably the most important issue, maybe in our lifetime, right? Yeah. Um, we have uh, what else do we have going on? We have uh, Facebook stuff that we want to talk about, and I I want to have a discussion maybe after the first break or maybe sooner if you want to take it sooner. Um, I want to talk about how the media can be accurate but wrong. Accurate but wrong in in uh, reporting it. In yeah, other words, they shouldn't have reported something. it. So well, I mean, I don't want to say in other right, words. I don't want right. to get into this into the discussion. But but I, but I want you to think about that. When when you call a newspaper and say, "Hey, wait a minute, I was at that event, and that's 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 inaccurate," you got to. They'll say, "No, no, it was accurate. It might be wrong, but it was accurate when we reported it." And I want to I want to have a conversation about okay. that because there's a lot of that going on in Washington, and most people don't understand that. And I've got some good local examples because it happened to us within the last uh, maybe 10 days. Okay. Uh, so I want to use what happened to us at the local level to explain to you how the media then perverts that thing in order to push an agenda. So where do you want to go first, Paul? We've got election stuff. We've got... Well, um, let's, let's talk first about... Um, I want to talk generally about the, the, the shift that the Democratic Party is, is going towards socialism. It's a huge revolution. But, but particularly, let's, let's talk about Capu, Capu, Capuano. How, how do you say his last name? Uh, Mike Capuano. Ma, Mike Capuano, yeah. Good friend of the show. I remember him calling up in uh, WCA. Oh, was, yeah, should I even were, say it? Yeah, yeah. Right, we WCAP C radio, C yeah. Used to call in all the time. Yeah. He loved us. Yeah, he didn't like me. I, I, no, no, he didn't. I tried to pin him down uh, once uh, on a question. He didn't like it. Right. But uh, interesting. Interesting how he's been there for what, 10, 20 years? Yep, he's a congressman from Massachusetts at Southern yeah. Bo South Boston. For decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just ousted by a young woman who, I think she's either a self proclaimed socialist or she's on the verge, right? Right, yeah. On the edge. And she's a black African American. Yeah, and that seems to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they go together, but that's well because to be people a say African American, but yeah. Shalise Theron <laughs> immigrated to America from mm. from Africa, and she's the whitest white woman on the planet. So yeah. she's technically an African American. So when people but say African American, that doesn't mean skin color. Doesn't necessarily mean black. Yeah. So I think we have we have to distinguish between white yeah. African Americans and black. There, there are white people in Africa. After yeah, all. it's like white Hispanic and black Hispanic, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, but so far, so we've got the the Cynthia Nixon thing in New York. We've got the. Uh, uh, what's her name? The Hispanic lady who uh, who won the congressional. Um, yeah, Cortez. Yeah, Cortez. And, yep. And there's this one other big one. I can't remember her, his or her name at the point. But anyway, the Democratic Party seems to be going that. Oh, the guy in um, the guy in Florida. The yeah, that guy. Governor, <laughs> the governor um, of, uh, of the who won the governor's primary for the Democrats. Yes. Uh, is uh, a Deval Patrick clone, yep. pretty much yep. politically, anyway. Right. He's he he looks like him. He speaks like There's him. There's a cancer in this country, and he's of socialist an, of anti-Americanism, but they don't want to call it anti-Americanism. Just like they don't want to say they're for open borders, even when they are, because everything's about what you call things. We are in a culture where you are forced to lie about everything. And I think they're beginning, it seems like they're beginning not to lie anymore, though. Well, I think they're being much more brazen. A lot of them yeah. are being all much more brazen about it now that it's safer to say these things because they're more socially acceptable <laughs> to say. Yeah. Um, but you're right. There is, I mean, when you if you put on CNN, you would think the Republican Party is crumbling, mm. right? Mm. But the reality is the Democrat Party is the one that's crumbling. And by the way, couldn't happen to a nice group, nice group of people. <laughs> I mean... I mean, seriously, uh, I looked at the Mike Capuano right. thing, and, and I actually wrote about this in my, in, uh, in my notebook this mm -hmm. month, uh, the Valley Patriot, which will be on the streets at some point this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, here we have a rich, white guy in power yeah. who's a liberal, who's in Congress, who represents the Boston area, which is the richest, whitest, uh, one of the richest, whitest cities in the country, and the most liberal in the country. Yeah. And this is a guy that has spent like the last 20 to 25 years of his life preaching about diversity and minority set-asides and affirmative action and why we should take jobs away from white people and mm. give them to minorities because, because of 400 years of slavery and, and oppression and systematic discrimination and, and all of these abstract baloney concepts that the Democrats like to talk about as if they're the most important things in the country. 
And I don't think it ever dawned on him that, A, he's too stupid to be on his own side because he's white. And eventually, if you're a white guy in power, if you're a rich white guy in power and you preach taking jobs away from white people and giving them to non-white people for the sake of something that happened when we, you know, long before we were all born, eventually you're going to be the white guy that gets replaced by the non-white person. Well, it's interesting. It seems like, and it's just, just at the, we're at the beginning stages of the Democratic Party doing that, of getting rid of all of the rich, mm-hmm. uh, older white guys right. and replacing them with younger female um, eth- eth- ethnic uh, candidates. And I think when in 2020 runs around, uh, comes around, who do you have right now that's top of the tier? Joe Biden, a rich white guy? Yeah, if he's an, even an old, around at an that old, point. An old white guy. And right. uh, Bernie Sanders, an old white Another guy. Old white guy. Um, I Elizabeth, don't know. Elizabeth Warren, a rich white woman. Yeah, yeah, a rich old white woman. Right? But see, this is, this is why, they, again, they're too stupid to be on their own side. Because let's face it, and I know a lot of people aren't going to like what I say, but it happens to be the truth, so let's say it. Black voters are the racist, some of the racist voters in the country. They vote racist. They will vote for black before they will vote for a white, regardless of, wh- regardless of what your political philosophy is, where you stand on most of the issues. Latinos, and in fact, we talk about this in Lawrence all the time, because Lawrence has, uh, Lawrence is majority Latino, but it's broken down into different Latino groups, right? Yeah. Dominicans in Lawrence will, if there's a chance to vote between a Dominican and a white person, will always vote for the Dominican. If there's a chance to vote between a Dominican and a, and a Puerto, Puerto Rican, Rican, will always vote for a Dominican. But if there's a choice between, if you're if the, to Dominican voters in Lawrence. Between a Puerto Rican and a, and white, a white guy. guy, they vote for the white guy. Because they hate Puerto Ricans more than they hate whites. But the one thing they all agree on is that whitey's racist. Okay, so you they... You know what I'm saying? They, like, don't, they hate Puerto Ricans more than whites, but yes. not, be, not because they're racist, just because they're Puerto Ricans. Is that what you're saying? Well, what that, no, what I'm saying is, hmm. by virtue of hating anybody over anybody based on race, you're autom- automatically a racist before we start the discussion. Yeah. Right? So you have all these stupid white people who are too dumb to be on their own side, who won't vote for their own race because that's racism and that's wrong, while everyone else is voting for their own race. Yes. Oh, you see what I'm saying? I do, and, but they think that they have enough money to overcome all of that. Right, and, and for a short period of time, that will be true. And I think Hillary Clinton thought the same thing. Yeah, I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you. Well, Tom, I think there's this misconception that only white people are racist. Right, right. Well, and, that, and that's one of the cancers that, is, that has invaded our culture, where we've had our public education system and our college system uh, indoctrinate young people in the last three generations to believe that only white people can be racist, which, by the way, is racist. <laughs> Right, well, I, I do think. I mean, the whole definition of racist is what is, is the definition? Is sta- I think that's the problem. It's to label and stereotype people based on their race, to treat people differently based on their race, to think that someone inherently is something because of their race. If I came in today and talked about the numbers of violent crimes in this country committed by blacks, even though they only represent seven percent of the population or thirteen percent of the population. And then compare that to the violent crimes committed by whites, which is maybe like, I don't know what the actual number is, let's say it's 75% of the country, right? And you compare it, it's obvious that blacks commit more, more, blacks proportionally commit more violence in America than whites, period. Whether it's black on black, black on white, whatever. But if I came in and I said that and we talked about it for a half an hour, I'd be a racist. Because why are you pointing out that black people are, right, are more violent or commit more violent crimes? On the other hand, all we hear about is white people committed the genocide of the Holocaust, white people enslaved black people, and and for some reason, dead people who did bad things before I was born are supposed to be taken, well, are supposed to be held against me. Somehow, I'm supposed to be responsible because of the color of my skin for what other people with the same skin color have done, even though we were told for 40 years in this country that that's that's racist. That's it, wrong. It's interesting how you say before you were born that the media pretty much and liberals pretty much ignore what has been going on in the past five to ten years Mm -hmm. in places like africa there has been there have been genocides there's there's Mm -hmm. one supposedly going on right now in nigeria but uh black on black violence all you have to do is look in chicago right and uh it's it's prevalent today it's not something 200 years ago it's going on today and it's going on in big numbers and this is why you see idiots like colin kamernick and all these all these assholes in the nfl which we boycott here at the paying attention podcast um talking about police brutality against blacks 
Why, why do they want to have all this big national focus on police brutality against blacks, even though the numbers show that it's not a big problem? It's because what they don't want you to focus on is black violence in America. Blacks, black, black violence against other blacks, black violence against white, black violence against anybody. Hmm. They don't want you to focus on black violence and the reason why cops are pulling these people over and arresting these people. They want to talk about the fact that police officers, once in a while, there's a guy somewhere in Baltimore who is, happens to be white, who shoots a guy who happens to be black, and whether it was racial or not, it becomes a big race problem. Well, I don't know if... Are you saying that most, most black people in this country um, do this on purpose because they don't want to focus on black on black crime? Or are you saying the upper echelons saying, of the media? Right, yes. Okay, all right. So that, you, that I can understand. So you've got, you've got rich, multi-millionaire black football players yeah. who, who, by the way, because they live in America, are rich black football players making millions of dollars to throw a ball around for a couple of years and they want to talk about the oppression of black men by the way this all started while we had a black man as president because blacks are so oppressed in this country yet yet you want to talk about cops lives matter hmm. or white lives matter and you get lectured about something that happened long before we were born because of slavery and the, my, here's my favorite one institutional racism yes they have to create some kind of abstract boogeyman that they can then use to be racist against you because when you talk about individuals when you talk about treating in, i was brought up to believe and maybe maybe wrong maybe we'll, maybe wrongly we were brought up to believe in being colorblind that you treat the individual based on the individual, that Martin Luther King was right, you treat people based on the content of their character, and yet since Martin Luther King has died, the, the, the black population in this country, for the most part, has rejected, even though, they, even though they celebrate Martin Luther King as a man, they've rejected his entire philosophy of treating people based on the content of their character, especially when you hear things like what Ed said, and we usually hear it from, uh, from, uh, from black politicians, that uh, black people can't be racist. Hmm. Because racism is institutionalization stuff. Yeah. Um, that, a was, lot that was my Jesse Jackson. Yeah, indeed. There's a lot to say about that. I'm having on pretty soon um, a few bla black students of mine to right. talk about black, my, uh, black Lives Matter on mm -hmm. my radio show Beneath the Surface. And um, there's, I had one white guy in my class last semester who was very adamant that uh, Black Lives Matter is a... Uh, not only a racist organization, but a terrorist organization. I would agree with that. And they almost got into a fist fight right in the middle of my really? class. Really? Yeah. And if they Literally. did, you know who would have been at fault? Me, regardless, probably. The rega <laughs> no, rega <laughs> regardless of who threw the first punch, it would be the white guy's fault. And it would be considered mm. a hate crime. Yeah. Right? Because they were discussing race. Uh, probably, but hopefully. Hopefully there won't be any violence in the studio when that yeah, happens. No, we, we don't, we don't, but we don't, I, I do think that um, there are a lot of black people in this country who honestly, sincerely and perhaps wrongly uh, believe that there is institutional racism at least amongst cops, at least amongst the police. Uh, police um, Even though studies show that black police, police officers departments kill and assault black mm. defendants at almost like twice the rate as white police officers, which is weird because mm. black police officers make up like 3% of the population of police officers. Right, so once again, you're talking about a very small group of people, very small statistic, being responsible for far more than the, uh, maybe three to four hundred percent more than the other ninety-five percent, right? I, so, don't, I don't think black people are making any distinction between black and white police officers. They're just talking about police departments in general. Right. And so I don't know how when, when every police department is different across the mm. country, they're all trained differently. They all have different local ordinances to enforce. Like in Lawrence, we have noise ordinances that you might not have in North Andover. We, they, there are certain other types of ordinances about not playing your music uh, at a certain time in a park on a weekend that you might not have in Andover. Every community has a different police department. They have different training. They have different procedures that they use to pull people over. Um, and yet somehow we're supposed to believe that police officers, as if they're all one group, they all get trained exactly the same way, mm -hmm. and they're all the same color, that somehow cops, quote, are racist. Now, of course, there are racist cops. There are racist talk show hosts. There are racist mailmen. There are racist doctors. There are black racists, white racists, Latino racists, Asian racists. But for some reason, we're only allowed to talk about white racism, which, by the way, does exist. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on board with that. There are, there are white racists. Um, 
but then you watch like the the Kavanaugh hearings. I don't know. Did you watch any of the Kavanaugh hearings? I listened to some on the radio, but no, I didn't Fascinating watch. Fascinating stuff. Uh, it was probably boring for most people. For me, it was highly entertaining. I'm watching it on CNN as I do in my office all the time while I'm working on the paper. And I go on Twitter. I think it was after the first day of testimony, and um, some idiot took a screenshot of the woman behind Kavanaugh who was his aide. I can't remember her name. The dark-haired girl? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Gorgeous-looking yeah. Spanish I, That's probably Spanish why she's there. Girl, right? Of course she is, right? Yeah. I mean, if I was going to be going for the Supreme Court, I'd put a hottie <laughs> behind me, too. Get everybody to focus on her. So, so, so all of a sudden, there's this huge Twitter storm because she was supposedly, with her fingers, making a white supremacy signal. Oh, wow. Okay, so this went really? all over Twitter, Facebook, it was on Instagram. It got a million shares. It got three million shares. Because this woman was obviously, because she's with, she's with uh, Kavanaugh, she's obviously a, sending secret signals. And this is, the, this is the dementia that has seeped into the left that has seeped into the Democrat Party and that has seeped into the Socialists, is that everything to them is about codes and everything's about signals. And that way they can dog kind of... Dog whistles. That way, dog, that way they can interpret something however they want and then declare it to be whatever they want it to be. Hmm. And what they didn't do was their friggin' homework. Because the woman sitting behind Kavanaugh is not white, by the way. She's a Latina. And she's Jewish. And she's the, hmm. and she's the granddaughter of... Uh, uh, of her grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust. Hmm. Okay? They were Holocaust victims. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure the granddaughter of Holocaust victims who happens to not be white is not sitting behind mm -hmm. Kavanaugh on live TV throwing white power signals I've never heard with that. her fingers. That's like, bizarre. I don't know. I, I never even heard of... Like, I know that gang members have, have like, gang signs that they do with their fingers, Right. I, I mean, because we deal with it in Lawrence all the time, right? You get the uh, MS-13 has their own signal. The Crips have their own signal, right? But I never... It, it, I've, I've seen so many movies on the Klan. I've seen so many movies on white supremacy, on neo-Nazism. I'm Jewish, so I'm, I'm interested in these things, right? I've never once seen any documentary, read any book, that there's ever been a white power or white supremacy hand signal. Ever. Like, this is the first time, it's, I'm at 51 years old, this is the first time I've ever heard this. Never. Never. Right? But never somehow, somehow they found it. They had to find some way to make this guy a Nazi. <laughs> they had to. Because that's the go-to mm -hmm. when you have some, when somebody's doing something you don't like yeah. and you're a leftist, you have license to call them a Nazi. And even if there's no evidence, just make up the evidence. Well, look what she did with her finger. That must be a white power signal. Wait, what? Well, Are you kidding me? So, by the way, yes. speak, speaking of the uh, Supreme Court's uh, charade. Yes, Paul. Don't you think it's funny? And, and I, I find it very sad. And um, Are you really sad, Paul? I find it frustrating. Does it make you cry? It, it, it frustrates okay, me. I wouldn't say right. cry. Yeah. Frustrates me. That somebody like Kavanaugh has to go there and... and Why? Complete this entire charade about how sensitive he is. Right. And how he acknowledges the pain of people. And how he recognizes the equality of everyone. And he works for the poor. And he, and he loves the homeless. And... All of these points, all of these trigger points that are supposed to make the left say, hey, he's a nice guy. Which they never will anyway, so why the, bother? I mean, the, the overdoing of that yeah. is just way too much. And just talk about what, what it's like and what it should be like to be a judge. This entire hearing, <laughs> just like all the other hearings in the last 10 years, has been scripted. The whole, hearing, totally. the whole hearing is scripted. So it's not real. They're not asking real questions that they care about. Um, you don't, you're not going to get one Democrat vote for this nominee yet for the last three days. <laughs> no, the whole thing is already, I mean, everybody knows who's going to vote right. where. We already know what the vote's going to be. Mm -hmm. But they sit there and they say things like, well, you, uh, how come we can't get documents about your record? What does it matter? You already said you're voting no. Why would we give you any documents <laughs> if you, like, look, if you said, look, uh, I'm a Democrat and I mm. might vote for this guy. I'm really open-minded. If you show me some documents about his past, mm. um, you know, maybe I'll vote for the guy. Then, okay, then you've got a complaint because you didn't get the documents that you asked for. But the Democrats have already said in tandem, in unison, they're all voting no. So why would we mm. give you anything? We're going to have anything? this kabuki theater where the Republicans are going to say how much he loves children and he yes. pets puppies on Sundays when yes. he's coming out of church. And then the 
the Democrats are going to get up there and say he's Adolf Hitler and Pol Pot and, right. and Joseph Stalin all rolled into one. Yep. And then everyone knows how everyone's going to vote, and that's going to be the end of it. So why go through the exercise? Like, What is the point of all this? It's to make stupid people believe government really works. And the second point is so that these folks will get reelected next time around because they're actually talking to their constituents right, here right. to make them feel good. Hey, right. I did my part, wink and a nod. Um, but even his introduction, you remember his introduction when, when tr uh, Trump introduced him to the world? Uh, yeah, then he, started he came out with his, with his family with his and, daughters. and his daughters, and they did the high five, Trying and hey, I'm a family man, hey, my soccer daughter, my so I'm a soccer dad. I don't care what you are. I want to know what kind of judge you are and how you will judge things. Right. I want to judge. I, this isn't, we're not, you, you're not coming here to be a, a neighbor or a saint or a family member. No, we're not you're electing a be, pope. You're coming here to be a judge. Right. You know what I, you know what I really wanted to see, because we'll no. never see it in our lifetime, but I can fantasize, right? I want to see a, a, a guy like Kavanaugh come out in the first day and say, hey, you know what? Fuck all of you. <laughs> We already know how you're all going to vote. I'm not answering yeah. any questions. I don't care if you ask me my middle name. I'm not telling you. I, I'm going to sit here until you guys finish bloviating for your base, and then you take a vote so I can be on the Supreme Court, because I got the votes. I've got the votes, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop the vote, and I'm going to sit here and screw, screw all ears. That's a guy I could get behind. That's a guy I could get behind. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll settle for answering the questions. Actually, like he really wants to in his heart, I'll, I'll settle for that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll probably vote against Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, it's a terrible law, and this is why. Listen, Scalia was the greatest jurist we've had in the history of this country. And Scalia was so succinct and so brilliant hmm. in discussing why it's of paramount importance to be an originalist, and for, for yes. a constitutional originalist. Yes. The Constitution says what it says... And it doesn't say what it doesn't say. And abortion is nowhere in the Constitution. A right to privacy is nowhere in the Constitution. If you want it in the Constitution, you get with your fellow man, you have a constitutional convention, you convince your fellow citizens, and you change the Constitution. Now abortion's in the Constitution. But, but jurists are not supposed to sit there and worry. Like I heard Democrats all day yesterday saying, well, what about the poor? What about the people affected mm. by these decisions? You're not supposed to take that into consideration. You're supposed to apply the law and by to the, the way, case in front of you. That's totally right. But Kavanaugh kept bending over backwards for them saying that. Listen, I, I, I'm not real happy with the nomination, quite frankly, but it's yeah. the best we've got, and so we've got to go with it. I just hope he's, he's sort of just playing the game. That's yeah. what I hope. I, I think Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned within the next 10 years. I really believe it's bad law. Um, it was, it was, it's unconstitutional and anti-constitutional, uh, and it needs to go. And here's the other thing Scalia said that I really loved, was that, you know, if, if you want to have abortion, why do you need a constitutional um, right to an abortion? Your legislator can get together and make abortion legal. Oh, yeah. the Constitution, well, that's what Roe v. Wade will do if it's struck down and right. bring it back to the states. Right. Let it go to the states and let them decide. So if Massachusetts wants to have all the abortions that they want, fine. And if New Hampshire wants mm -hmm. to outlaw abortion, go to Massachusetts to get your abortion. Uh, well, I, I know what you're saying, but on another level, I don't consider it fine. Well, <laughs> I, no, listen, I, I think then you got to go to, then you start get politicking and, uh, you know, convincing and persuading people of your own but state. But that's what a constitutional republic is supposed to be. And don't be fooled mm. by all these idiot Democrats who, who say that we're a democracy. They're constantly calling us a mm. democracy. We are not a democracy. In a democracy, every time the city wants to put up a stop sign, you'd have to have a vote. That's yeah. a democracy, right? Well, not only that, Hillary, Hillary Clinton would be president now if it was a total that, democracy. That's right. And by the way, that's mm. why the, Demo the Democrats hate our constitutional republic. They hate our constitution. They hate our, our individual liberties. They value equality over, over liberty. Because if you have liberty, you have the liberty to discriminate against someone. Hmm. So they don't want you to have individual liberty. They want equality. They want the government to force you to be equal to other people so we can all feel good about ourselves. And by the way, there's actually a word for that. It's called communism. Hmm. Right? Yeah. I think that uh, also, though, I think that the word um, liberty has been uh, bastardized the past couple of hundred Watch years. Watch your mouth, Paul. It has been uh, distorted. Uh, that to mean, uh, basically to mean license right. rather than the freedom to do what one ought to do. Right. So I'm watching this, uh, this Kavanaugh hearing, and I'm listening to all these people talk about Roe versus Wade and guns and all this other stuff. And it's really sad Obamacare. that Obamacare. Obamacare. And it's really sad that um, Kavanaugh or anybody else in his position on the Democrat or Republican side are forced to get up and lie. They're mm. forced to get up and lie. They're forced to put on 
a facade and act because everybody's acting. They're all actors in a play when, when you're watching these things. The Democrats even coordinated beforehand who was going to ask what question and in what succession they were going to ask the question yeah. so that they could make certain points for their, quote, base, yes. right? Yes. For their base voters. Yes, yes. Because half this country hates America. Now, when you say, why do you hate America? Just like when you say, why are you, get, why, why are you for open borders? They lie. Because they have to lie, because those phrases have been negatively poll tested. So you say, oh no, I don't hate America, but we want, this is not where we stand. That's not who we are. Remember that? That's not who we are. This is not who we are. Well, guess what? It is who we are. We've had racist presidents. Lyndon Johnson called Jews kikes. Richard Nixon called black people the N-word. Uh, Andrew Johnson was a, was a raging, raging racist. And you know, America did just fine. <laughs> America did just fine. So all these people who happen to be minorities and, uh, and unfortunately have been brainwashed by our education and our media think that racism is the biggest problem in America. No, it's not. In fact, it's not even really a big problem in America. Right? And, and by the way, the group that it's okay to be racist to today is white people. And I'm still saying that it's not really a big problem in America. We have so many other problems in this country that need to be handled, that need to be taken care of. And race isn't one of them. Yet you listen to the Democrat Party, you think that's the, you would think that America has, has we, that we still own slaves. Right? You would think that women are still chained to radiators in their kitchen. Yeah. They're forced to cook for their husbands. You would think that black people... Put you all in chains. Yeah, right. Remember that? <laughs> uh, what's his name? Joe Biden? Joe Biden. A few years ago. Right. They'll put you all in chains mm -hmm. with, the, with the southern accent. Y'all. And it goes back to all this code stuff that I want to wrap this discussion up with. Um, I want to go back to Josh Ernest when he was the uh, press secretary for Barack Obama. And again, I can't remember what it was that Barack Obama said, but he said something that everybody got outraged by. And Josh Ernest had to come, come out and kind of walk it back a little bit. And he, said, and he told the press, what you have to understand is he was sending code to the base. It was the first time I'd yeah, heard an official. I remember that, yeah. First time I'd heard an official actually admit that they're talking in code. Mm. Right, which means, by the way, translation, it was a lie. Mm. He was saying something, but he wanted some people to interpret it in a totally different way, as a mm. totally different context, because they were sending well, codes to the base. Can we all just say what we think? Isn't that what's going on in this entire um, Kavanaugh thing? Yes, yes. I mean, that's the, it's, for example, that's Al, Al Shopton is famous for coming out and saying that um, any law that, that disproportionately hurts poor people is racist, mm. because most most poor people are a black or minority, right? According mm -hmm. to Al Shopton. Okay, yeah. Yet then he go, he and the Democrats go railing against rich people, which, by the way, is code for what? White. So it's okay, it's okay to rail against rich people as code for white, but it's not okay to talk about poor people, which is code for black. So if we're all walking around trying to figure out what the friggin' codes are every day, it's no wonder everybody's afraid to talk. <laughs> like we've lost our First Amendment right without losing it yet. Do you remember when, when it used to be upper class, middle class, and lower class? Right. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the words changed to working class. Right. Well, you couldn't say lower class well, anymore. It's like when Democrats talk about women's health. They're not talking about yeah. women's health. They're talking about abortion. They're talking about women killing their children. Right. So why not, just, why not just say that? But they can't say that because everything's about theater today. Nothing is what it appears to be. Nothing. And it's sad because now we have a culture where they, we are more... We are more racially divided now than we were in the 70s and the 80s, right? Yeah, I think, the, I think the last few years have borne that out. There's more hatred um, for each other as Americans. Uh, if you're a conservative, regardless of race, whether you're conservative or liberals, there's more hatred among the political ideologies. And there's more hatred, period. And, you know, I don't know that, I don't know that our culture survives. I mean, I think... I think the one reason why they hate Donald Trump is he's the first guy that pulled the curtain back and said, I'm not, mm. I'm not following your script. Yes. I'm going to say what I think. I don't care if you're outraged. And then, of course, you put on CNN and every single day it's DEFCON 5, <laughs> right? It's every – Donald Trump tweeted today that he likes chocolate milk. That's really secret code for racism. Why is he a white supremacist? It's stunning. It's unprecedented. No, it's not stunning. It's not unprecedented. And it's not racist. You're an idiot. And you are promoting propaganda of hate. Hate, yet they're always the ones that are doing what they're accusing Donald Trump of doing. Well, that that often happens. Yeah, transference or projection. Yeah. So, anything else on, on on any of this, Paul? Um, on this topic? I, no, it's just I just wish people, like you said earlier, I just wish people would say what they actually mean. 
and mean what they say. I agree. The, the, the world would be so much simpler. But when you do, because I do, yeah. and trust me, I get my ass kicked for it on a regular basis. When you do, you're constantly on the defensive to explain that what you said wasn't racist, sexist, homophobic. Uh, what, what, what was that word Jesse Jackson used? Arabashinatism. Mm-hmm. This Arabashinatism. I think he was trying to say Arab bashing, but he just got it wrong because oh. he's an idiot. Oh, okay. Right? But by the way, it, we live in a country where if you're a racist, and I'm not... But if you're a racist, you have a right in this country to hate anybody you want based on anything that you want. We also have a right to call it out, right? If you're a racist and you hate black people, and there, and there are plenty of people out there that hate black people who are white, you have every right to be a white racist or a black racist. But we have every right to call it out and to criminalize people's opinions, to criminalize people's attitudes is not... Is, is not the fabric of a free nation. It's not the fabric of a nation that cares about individual liberties. In Western Europe, it's, you, there are people in jail for saying they don't like Muslims, for saying they don't believe in gay marriage. They're literally in jail sitting in a cell because they said stuff either on Facebook or verbally that the government doesn't like. What that does, whether it's Germany or England or Spain, what that does is it drives the racists and the haters underground. It makes them create secret societies, and it makes it harder to identify who they are, and it turns them into domestic terrorists. That's what it does, right? The Klan wore hoods because they didn't want anybody to know who they were, right? But if they weren't wearing hoods, we would have all known that, like, you know, Sharif Smith was, the, you know, was one of the guys that hates black people. We would know if they weren't wearing yeah, a hood. Yeah. And by making, by making it criminal, or almost criminal, to believe what you think is true, even if you're wrong, you drive those people underground and you create a much unsafer society. That's my belief anyway. I'm sure I'll be called a racist for it, but... Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, and, and I would just make the distinction, being the philosopher that I am, that mm-hmm. uh, there's a difference between having a uh, civil right and having a moral right. Right. And we don't have a moral right to hate anybody, but we do have a civil right to hate uh, whoever we want as long as we don't act on it, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a little toleration there, of course, when it comes to civil rights. Now, if, if yeah, I mean, if they are not, um, um, if, if this country is serious about maintaining those civil rights, uh, then you're right. Then it comes out into the clear. People, people know who these people are. Right. I, mean, I want to yeah. know, I want to know if there's a cop on the and Lawrence Police Department who's white, who hates Latinos. I want to know that. Well, so a cop goes on Facebook mm-hmm. and he posts something racist. Don't take it off Facebook. Don't ban him from Facebook. We want to know who that guy is. Yes. Right? Don't, yes. we, don't we want to know? I want to know. I want to know. And then uh, just to segue out of this, um, we were talking about Capuano being beaten by, uh, by a black African-American woman. Um, at least the Democrats in that district are being honest about what they believe yeah. and, and practicing what they preach. On the other hand, in the third congressional district, you had 10 candidates. You had a gay guy married to another guy, Rufus. You had a he, she, it thing, whatever it is. It used to be a man, now it's a woman, or it used to be a woman, now it's a man who can keep track, right? You had a Latina millennial female from Lawrence running for Congress. Mm-hmm. You had, uh, uh, you, there were 10 candidates. You had as much diversity as you could possibly have, and Democrats say they love diversity. Who are the top two fighting right now in a... In a, in a uh, in a recount in the third congressional district. The rich white guy from Andover, Dan Coe, and the rich white woman, I think she's from Ashland, Laurie Trahan, right? Well, I guess money won that one, huh? Right. And Juana Matias in a distant third place, the, the Latina millennial female from Lawrence. Hmm. At least in South Boston, the Democrats aren't a bunch of friggin' hypocrites. <laughs> they say they believe in diversity, they voted that way. In the third congressional district, there's still a bunch of rich white liberals who pretend they care about diversity until mm. it comes to them. They want diversity for everybody else, but when mm-hmm. it comes to them, they're still voting for the rich white guy from Andover. And let me finish with this, Paul, because I know yeah. you want to jump in. Whenever I say to one of my Democrat friends, why did you guys vote for the rich white guy from Andover? Oh, no, no, he's not white. Tom, he's not white. <laughs> Dan Cole, he's not white. What, what no, is no, 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 his, his father was Lebanese. Great. His father was Lebanese. His mother was uh, South Korean. So he's not white. I'm sorry, folks. That's just a lie, okay? I'm not saying it's a lie where his parents came from. The lie is, when that guy walks into a room... Yes, what does he look like? He's white. (laughs) And if there's such a thing as white privilege, which we all know doesn't exist, but if we're going to follow the Democrat mantra of white privilege, when that guy walks into a room, he's got it. 
<laughs> He's the white guy. Yeah. So don't tell me you care about diversity, you care about gays, you care about uh, transgenders, that you care about minorities, Latinas, and blacks. When at the end of the day, you're still voting for the rich friggin' white guy from Andover. <laughs> That's all I want to say, right? I think their days are probably numbered. I think once this generation Listen, rich, you're right, rich white, dies off. Rich white liberals are an endangered yeah. species they, they right are. now. They are. And they're too stupid to know it. And you know when they're going to yeah. figure it out? Like when someone like Elizabeth Warren gets beat yeah. by like a Latina from Lawrence for the United yes. States Senate someday, yes. then they're going to go, oh, hey, wait, hold on a minute. No, that's, that's not what we meant. We meant like, you know, give other people, take other white people's jobs away and give, and give other black people their jobs, but not mine, not me. Don't make it me. And it goes back to what I originally said. White people, in general, are too friggin' stupid to be on their own side. They just are. Blacks are on their own side. Latinos are on their own side. Gays are on their own side. Le lesbians are on their own side. White people, too friggin' stupid. We're all running around going, oh, yeah. no, you know what, let's vote for the black guy because, and here's the other thing, every black candidate that won yesterday hates white people. Go on YouTube and listen to every single speech. They talked about white racism and black oppression and everything, every label and stereotype you can imagine about white Americans, they used it with impunity and nobody called them out on it. Nobody called them out on it. So listen, the liberal, liberal white rich people are an endangered species. And again, I want to wrap up with couldn't happen to a nicer group of people. <laughs> Just one comment. Um, yes, Paul. I think it's a shame that people are voting for their own side. As, yeah, I, as listen, you say. listen, I agree with I you. I mean, I've never voted for any side of mine in my life. I endorsed Juana Matias in the third congressional yeah. race. Okay. Right? She I, totally disagrees with everything I stand for. But when I asked her, why are you for open borders? The other nine candidates lied to me and said, I'm not for open borders. And then right. I asked them, well, what are you for? Well, we want everyone to stay. Don't build a wall. Give them all welfare. <laughs> give them citizenship and let them vote. I'm like, okay, so how are you not for open borders? No, no, no. It's not open borders. Right, right. When I asked Juana Matias, why are you for open borders? She said, she looked at me in the eye and she said, you know what, Tom? Here's why. And she gave me a list. And I said, she perfectly represents what Democrats say they believe in. She's young, Latina, female. She's a total socialist. She hates America. She doesn't want, she doesn't <laughs> want borders. She wants everyone in every other country to come here. She thinks white people are inherently racist by virtue of the color of their skin. She exactly exemplifies what the Democrat Party stands for. She's the one that it's, should win. It's refreshing for them to hear her. Just, right, yes. just, just like, they, I mean, the, the mirror thing is, uh, I think Republicans are finally saying, hey, we had a candidate that actually said what he meant and really meant it right. and, and he didn't speak political speech. Right. And they all hate Trump for one reason. He's white and even though Trump supporters won't say it, I'll say it, I'm a Trump supporter. Yeah. Trump is out there advocating for white people. He's out there advocating for the, for the middle class white voter, white American that has been trampled on for the last eight years of Obama who were told that they suck because they're white. And he's not saying it and, and Trump supporters aren't saying it but the fact is they hate Donald Trump because he's advocating for his own people. Now, we can say whether that's good or bad. We can have a long discussion about that. But the fact is, that's it. He's advocating for white Americans who share his skin color that are mostly middle, middle class, uh, 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 middle, what was the word you used earlier? Uh, working class? The working, yeah, cla working class. Wor the working class, not, not the white, class. the blue collar white voters used to always vote Democrat. That's right. They all, real they all started oh, to realize right around the Trump election that the Democrats have sold them out. All of these middle class workers. That's exactly how he became president. Wh white workers realized that by importing people from other countries who will work for 50 cents an hour takes away their union jobs. Yeah. And, that's, and what they're trying to do, the Democrat Party's trying to do, is they're trying to replace white voters that used to vote for them with, with minorities. citizens of other countries who aren't even supposed to be here to begin with. Do you think that this is evolving into a two-party system in the United States where it's the pro-white the pro -white party and the pro-minority party? Go, there's going to be... A, I, mean, I mean, we might as well just call it that. I agree. There, there is a racial war going on. It's only being waged by one side. Um, but at some point, the other side's going to fight back. And when that happens, I, I, I fear for when that happens. I don't want to see it happen, but I think it's going to happen. And when it does happen, I'm pretty sure it's not going to turn out the way the left thinks it's going to turn out. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, unfortunately, we, we are going to end up in this country with some kind of a totalitarian system rather than a constitutional republic. And we really only have ourselves to blame. 
right? You have all these ridiculous, idiot, rich, white liberals that are out there promoting all of these abstract concepts that they don't even care about, but they say it because they want to maintain power for themselves. And they don't care how much it's hurting the country. And it's very sad. I listen to Elizabeth Warren every time she speaks. I love it. I love, I love, because it just, it's like, Good is bad, bad is good, dry is wet, up is down. Everything is, the, it's like 1984. It's like the novel 1984. Yeah. We're living it. Yeah. So, anyways. You know what I think? What do you think, Paul? I think that there should be um, term limits. No, I, I'm, I think, I'm totally against term I know. limits. And I was too. But I, I think that the more that this nonsense goes on, that people are just, just say what they need to say in order to be reelected, I, I think that this country would be better served. Yeah, the insider class is always going to get around term limits. Well, let's just use like a local example. In Methuen, they put in term limits a few years ago. And so you, ha you have three terms you can serve in the city council. You can serve three terms in the school committee. You can serve three terms as mayor. So what do people in Methuen do? You had one guy who served three years in the school committee left, ran for city council, served three years, went back to the school committee for three more years, right? And you have other people doing the same thing. So now you have school, you look at the makeup of the Methuen school committee like three years ago, it's your city council now. You look at the makeup of your city council now, it was like the makeup of your school committee four, three, six years ago. So the insiders are always gonna get around it. They're always gonna find a way to maintain power. If you have, if you have term limits, you end up having a whole class of people in government who are not elected who will end up running everything because they can't get thrown out. They're employees, right? The staffers on the Hill in D.C. or in mm. Beacon Hill in Boston, the people who run City Hall in Methuen or Lawrence, those are going to be, be the people who say to the elected officials, hey, screw you. Six years from now, you're going to be gone. I'm still going to be here. I'm union. Hmm. Right? And then who's really in control? It's not us. If that's the case, then those jobs should be limited. Yeah, we should limit everybody. You can only work in any job well, for one year. Government jobs. Yeah, you can only work in government jobs for one year, and that's it. You're out. Doesn't have to be one year. Okay, two years. No, a few years. All right. We're going to take a quick break. It's uh, with six minutes to wait on the break. Ed Sullivan, the voice of purgatory. We come back. I want to talk about some of the election results that happened yesterday. And I also want to talk about when the media gets it accurate but wrong. And I know that people's brains are going to snap when they, when they try and think about that concept. We're going to explain it to you using some local examples that happened to us last week and then show you how the media on the larger scale uses that to manipulate you. A&M Auto Body, we got our friend Angelo over there. Angelo Memolo over there, he does great work on your car. So if you got a ding in your car, somebody hits you, you got a mechanical problem, you bring it to A&M Auto, he's on South Broadway in Lawrence on Inman Street, Angelo will take care of you. Um, so what's the address there? 341 Three South Broadway, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Then we got Joe Zingales, Rosanna Zingales Lopez from Century 21. They have been with us from the very first edition of the Valley Patriot. They've been with us from the very first Paying Attention show, which was in 1999, back when he was Remax. He's not Remax anymore. Now he's Century 21, Team Zingales. And they sponsor our bash. They gave a $1,000 scholarship this year. They gave a $2,000 scholarship last year. And that money comes right out of their pocket. That's not like they're collecting money from other people and just using it like I do. They actually took money out of their pocket. So I don't know why these guys love me so much. I really don't. But Twin Lights, let me tell you how, how dedicated I am to helping my sponsors. The guys at Twin Lights Security needed an extra security guy to do private investigations and to do security for a certain thing in Boston and they posted it on my page and asked if it was okay if they could use my page to solicit hiring people and I said you know what as busy as I am these guys sponsor the show they sponsor the Valley Patriot they give us a thousand dollars for the bash I'm gonna go work for these guys so I called up Pat McLaughlin and I said look you help us every single time we need something whenever I put out a call you're there if you need an extra person and you're short I'll take the night off and I'll come work for you. And so I, ha so I have been. I've been doing some work for them because they're helping us. And so there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to find a way to help them in the meantime. So if you need security or if you're getting divorced and you need a private investigator, if you have a business and you need a private investigator or security, uh, you want to call Twin Lights Security. They're based out of Gloucester, but they're very local. If while I'm driving around Lawrence, I get shot and killed, Make sure you get my body to Perez Funeral Home because we do business with the people who do business with us. And he's on South Broadway. With the, it, it's the old Scott Funeral Home. If, you were, if you're an old-time Lawrence resident, it's the old Scott Funeral Home on, on South Broadway. Perez Funeral Home at 298 South Broadway in Lawrence. 
Um, you can, they do crematory services. They do all the stuff that they're supposed to do, right? And uh, Mike's a, a big fan of the show. He followed us when we go live. He's in advertising now in the print edition of the paper, and he's now sponsoring this program. Perez Funeral Home and Crematory Services, 298 South Broadway in Lawrence. We appreciate him. Uh, Franklin Veloz from Veloz Auto Group. Uh, he specializes in people that have uh, maybe bad credit, no credit. Maybe you haven't had a job for a long period of time, so you don't think that maybe you qualify for a car loan. Usually, you know, they want you to have a job for a year or more. Uh, he specializes in getting people who have bad credit or no credit or maybe spotty credit, uh, getting them into a used car. He used to work for Charlie Dears Commonwealth Motors for a long, long time, so he knows his stuff. I think he was a credit manager over there or something. So he knows what he's doing, and, um, and he follows us live, too. I really appreciate that he does. Every time I see him pop on, I'm very excited about it. And I was there yesterday to deliver his newspaper, and he said he's already had customers come in from us talking about him on this show. So we appreciate Veloz Auto Group. Go see Franklin. He's at 17 Mass Ave. It's right at the very beginning of Mass Ave on the Lawrence North Andover line. Yeah, we'll get Domingo to come on. We'll get Domingo and Marcos come on. And we'll have them talk about Dominicans versus Puerto Ricans. What's that, Dave? Puerto Rican, the lower or is the lowest form or? Well, yeah, they, they both think the other one is lower. We're, we're live. Hey, thanks for coming back here on the Paying Attention Podcast. Paul, come on, be ready now. It's bad enough he's late for every show. I'm, I'm talking to our vast yeah, audience. Right. Uh, yeah, we do have a, we have a studio audience today. We appreciate that. A vast studio vast audience. Vast studio today. audience. So before yes. we get to uh, before we get to um, I don't know how I lost all of my notes here. Before we get to the uh, the election stuff, we had a couple of incidents, Paul, last week where um, it reminded me of the concept in journalism of getting something accurate but wrong. Okay. So here's a couple things that happened to us, and then I want to segue into how the media uses stuff like this to manipulate people. So we, there was a shooting on East Haverhill Street a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago. My, my time frames were always wrong. My regular, re, mm. my regular followers know not to hold me to a time. So it was either last week or the week before there was a guy who was shot on East Haverhill Street. They did CPR on him on the scene. They got him to the hospital. About 20 minutes later, I got a phone call from one of my girls at the hospital who said he coded, he died. Hmm. So we posted online. Uh, we had been doing updates. The, the guy was shot. You know, here's what happened, whatever. And then when she called and she said he died, he coded, meaning he has no pulse. We posted that he died. And within a minute and a half, I got a phone call from a Lawrence police officer who said, listen, dude, I don't know who told you that, but I'm here and he's actually alive. So I'm like, shit, now what do I do? We got it wrong. Okay, I, I will always correct wrong. I don't care if it makes me look like I have egg in my face. I went back online and I said, um, correction. Um, and we had the guy's name. We posted his name. So-and-so is not dead. He's alive. And I got savaged for the next hour by people coming on. This is irresponsible of you. How dare you, how dare you post something without getting it confirmed? Why don't you do your effing job? And on and on and on with all the hate. So I put up with this, this was I think like on a Wednesday or Thursday night, and this went on throughout the night to about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I went to bed and I got up the next morning and there was a voicemail from uh, another girl that I know that works at the hospital, and I called her back. And she said, I just want to let you know, I'm looking at your Facebook feed, and I want you to know you didn't get that wrong. He did die. When, he, when they brought him in, he coded he had no pulse. And the girl that called you to tell you that he had no pulse, the minute she hung up the phone, went back to working on him. Apparently, I'm not going to say like what kind of a health worker she was. Could have been a nurse or a doctor, whatever. right? Went back to working on, her, on the guy, and they brought him back. But they were so busy trying to keep the guy a friggin' live that she didn't have time to call you and tell you, look, we brought the guy back. Hmm. So did we get the story wrong? Mm. It was accurate. Depends on what you mean by dead. So right. Dead. People usually mean irreversibly dead when they say right. dead. Right. So Not we, mostly dead. Right. Yeah. So we got it. We got it right. He was dead. But even mm. when we thought we got it wrong and we published, because I just assumed that like maybe my girl got it wrong. Right. So, okay, fine. So I posted, okay, we got it wrong. Here's the correction. The guy's alive and I get eviscerated. And then it turns out that we weren't wrong. So I posted the next day, by the way, we just got the story. We didn't get it wrong. The guy did die and they brought him back before they flew him to Boston. A couple of nights later, and it really was like two nights later, I'm listening to the scanner. I'm in my office 
and we hear the police call go out that a man attacked another man with a baseball bat on Essex and Jackson Street. Rich will remember this story. So I post, a man attacks another man with a baseball bat on Essex and Jackson Street. And it sat up there for about maybe 40 minutes and people are making comments, isn't that awful, isn't it terrible, whatever. And I get a phone call from a police officer who says, listen, you got that story wrong. So how did we get it wrong? I took it, I got it right from the police scanner. That, that's, well, the person who called said to the 911 dispatcher that a guy's attacking another guy with a bat. When we got there, the guy was gone. We found him at the hospital. We went and we interviewed him. And it turns out the guy hit him over the head with a milk crate, right? So I go on and I say, we got it wrong. We didn't really get it wrong, but I'll take responsibility. We got it wrong. The guy wasn't hit with a bat. He was hit with a milk crate. And everybody comes on saying, why can't you print accurate news? It was accurate. It was accurate at the time that we got it. We put it out as we got it. Um, the, the, you don't need 15 people to verify something like that. You're never going to find 15 people to verify something like that. But the minute we got it right, we put it up. Now, two things I want to talk about with this. First, when people attack you for getting something wrong, especially in this business, what they're telling you is when you find out you get something wrong, don't correct it. Leave the, leave the incorrect information out there because the minute you say you got something wrong, you're going to get attacked. People are going to attack you, your credibility, your family. You suck. How can you do this? You're irresponsible. What about the family? Right? That's what you're going to hear every time you try and correct something that you get wrong in this business. The other thing is that when, when you get something wrong or in a, when, you, when it's accurate but it turns out to be wrong, most people are just too stupid to understand that when there's an ongoing situation, things change right? You're, you're reporting on a shooting that's in progress, an active shooter, a fire, an accident where maybe somebody died, but then they get brought back. And people need to understand that not everything is black and white when you're reporting something as it's happening. That you have to kind of wait and continue to do the follow-up and continue looking for follow-up information to find out what the real case is. There are many times when we get to a shooting and we, here's another perfect example, Paul, uh, Thursday or Friday night. When was the car fire, Rich? Remember that Thursday or Friday night? I think it was Friday night. Uh, that's Sunday morning. Oh, could have been Sunday morning. Um, again, my days are always off. Uh, so we hear over the scanner that there's a car that crashed into a house on Chester Street, that the car was on fire. Then the next car that comes out while we're on our way there that says, now the house is on fire. The car caught on fire and now it caught the house on fire. So we get there and I hear a witness tell a police officer that the car was hit by another car, that the other car had a firefighter's license plate, here's the license plate number, and took off. So now I hear over the scanner, the cops are calling out with this license plate, we're looking for this car, right? Come to find out later on that there was no accident, that the guy crashed the car into the house, put gasoline on the car, lit the car on fire, jumped into another car that had firefighter plates on it, and took off. But what we reported was what the, what the witness at the scene told the, told the police officer, and we reported it that way. We didn't declare it as though it was true. We said, witnesses told the police that there was an accident and here's what happened. You wouldn't believe the emails that I got about how much I suck. You wouldn't believe. Why can't you do your homework and your zest to get everything so quick? You don't do your homework, you don't get your facts right, you're affecting people's lives. Look, we can only report what we have. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because those who run the media at the national level know all of this. <clears throat> They've all experienced it at some local level. And they use it to manipulate you. They will purposely come out and say, we were told that Donald Trump uh, drew a Nazi swastika on his bathroom wall. They didn't say that he did it, right? They're saying that someone told them that. But they also know that the average person their brain skips right over the part where someone said it, and they only hear what the declarative statement is, right? True. And so this is, how, this is one of the ways that the mainstream media lies and manipulates you. Um, there was, I'm trying to remember what the story was. Uh, oh, the guy, the cop killer in New Hampshire, who uh, they found at a campsite. Remember the picture of him? they pulling his head up. And he looks like he's kind of all beaten. Um, yep. The headline in the Manchester Union Leader or whichever New, New Hampshire paper it was, the headline was, Attorney says, colon, cop killer was beaten by police during arrest. Well, they, ha they obviously know 
that the average person is going to see that headline. Their brain is going to dismiss the part that his attorney says. They're going to look at the declarative statement well, of cop killer was beaten by police during arrest, and they're going to think that that actually happened, not that it's just an accusation. Well, this is what tabloids have always done since mm-hmm. the 1970s, since the National Enquirer began that stuff. Mm-hmm. To, to do exactly what you're saying. Right. A source says, and then they'll just go on with their own thing. Right. Um, so as long as, as long as you're saying, for example, uh, one source of mine from Lowell General Hospital has declared this, mm-hmm. um, I don't really see the problem unless... Uh, well, there is one problem with that. The word dead is the problem. Because right. people interpret the word dead as meaning... Final. A, a final, permanent situation. Right. He's gone. Um, and so in that respect, if, if you also interpret it that way, then you should have waited. No? Maybe. Until the hospital actually declared it officially. Well, but, but they don't do that. So in other cases, when someone gets shot, they can bring them to Lawrence General or Holy Family. The person dies. There is no official statement that comes from the hospital. And there's usually no official statement that comes from the police until the next day, the next morning when the administrators, the administrative cops like Tommy Cuddy, uh, come in, he's like a special assistant to the chief, right? Um, he'll come in and he'll issue a press release that there was a shooting yesterday and the guy died. But people want information now. They want information while it's happening. They want information immediately. So what we try to do is we try to give you the information that we have when we have it. And we always tell you, this is the information that we have. This is what we heard on the scanner. This is what we got from a police source. This is what we got from a hospital source. So a woman calls me and she says, the guy died. He did die. That was, cur- that was accurate. But then it turns out he's alive, so how can that be? Most people can't even think that maybe there's an alternative reason. Like maybe, maybe both of those statements can be true because we're so simplistic in our, in our society and in our culture. And by the way, we're also very stupid. Like we can't think beyond one or two concepts at a time. We're never looking to give someone the benefit of the doubt that maybe there's a third option here. Maybe mm. there's a chance that both of those statements are accurate. And then when you flip on CNN, you see how they weaponize that. Mm-hmm. and how they use that to try to purposely manipulate you. So we're only talking about shootings, and we're talking right. about fires, and we're talking about cars. But on the national level, they do it in politics. And they'll say, well, you know, uh, attorney so-and-so says Donald Trump uh, wears a white hood when he goes to bed and, uh, and prays to Adolf Hitler. But nobody hears the attorney said part, or someone said part. They hear the declarative statement, and they think it's true, especially if they want to believe it's true, if they hate Donald Trump. Or on the other end, if you hated Barack Obama, right, and a story came out that, you know, Barack Obama hates white people so much that he has a, a white person voodoo doll that he sticks <laughs> pins in every night before he goes to bed, mm-hmm. no one's going to see the someone said yeah. or so-and-so accused. They're going to see the declarative statement and think that that's real. And that's the play and trade of the national media today. They use it to manipulate you. So it all, it's a nefarious motive. They want to create the narrative rather than rather than report it. Right, yeah, well, yeah. The, the, the news is not really about news anymore. It's about politics. And right. you see that no matter what channel you watch, whether it's Fox, whether it's uh, CNN, whether it's MSNBC. And that's, that's part of the reason why half the country hates America today. We are a self-loathing culture. And it's very sad when you have people like the governor of New, New York saying America was never great. Well, then get the hell out of office. What are you doing representing us? Like, why are you here? If you think America was never great, if you, if you hate America, then get the hell out. Look, the best part about this country is you're free to leave. Well, you can't leave China. You can't leave North Korea. You can't leave Iran. But the best part about this country is if you hate it here, you're free to leave. But the rest of the world is trying to come here. Why? Because here is where we have individual liberty. Unfortunately, when the rest of the world gets here, the first thing they do is they try and turn us into the country that they fled. Mm. Right? I yeah. mean, people come here from Mexico. They want to fly Mexican flags. If you love Mexico so much, why did you leave? Then Donald Trump calls them shithole countries. That makes them a racist. Like, there, there is no reason anymore in any of these, in any of these topics, Paul. we got 10 minutes, right? Could I just um, sure. defend Governor Cuomo? And I've never defended him shame. in my life. Yes, but shame on you before you start. Yeah, it's, well, you know, even, even a, what did they say? Even a broken clock mm-hmm. is right twice a day. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying he was right. I'm just saying that... Even if he did, and he did, he did make that statement because he had to walk it back publicly, and he did walk it back pu- publicly. But even in making the statement that uh, I don't think America was ever great, that doesn't necessarily mean or translate into I hate America. Not necessarily, but in this case, it does. So you think he hates America? Yes. Look okay. at everything that he advocates for, right? Letting prisoners yeah. out of out of prison early, allowing prisoners to vote, 
um, making making smaller crimes not a crime anymore, right? Shoplifting, all this other stuff. The race baiting that he does, the class baiting that he does. Uh, he, he and the Democrat Party hate what America is because they've been brainwashed to believe that America is built on some evil racist institutional racism society. When the fact is... And yet all these minorities are, are risking their lives to come here. Right. Why is that? Yeah. And Donald do Trump... That and by the way, Donald Trump is a Nazi, yet if he was really a Nazi, could you go on CNN and call mm. him a Nazi? I'm pretty sure you'd be dead if you tried that if he was really a Nazi. Mm. But there'd be some Nazi mm. group out there taking you out for calling Donald Trump out as a Nazi if he was really a Nazi. So we're living this, this whole shadow life that's not even real. Everything is the opposite of what we call it, Paul. You spent too much time in front of CNN. CNN. Yeah, you're right about that. And M M MSNBC and Fox News. You know, ever since um, we unplugged cable, mm -hmm. I feel a lot mentally healthier. You feel happier about life? Uh, pretty much. I feel more at peace. Oh, good. Yeah. So the, so the, the, the lesson is don't watch cable news. Watch as, as, I can't little, I can't as little as possible. I can't disagree with that, by the way. And I watch CNN incessantly. There's like two shows on Fox that I watch. I watch Tucker Carlson because he's the most brilliant man on television. I agree. And I watch uh, Media Buzz on Sunday because they criticize the media and they talk about how the media got That's something wrong and something's right. That's a good show. And it's very fair. They, yeah. they, even when Fox gets something wrong, they'll talk about it even mm -hmm. though they're on Fox. The rest of the time, mm -hmm. seven days a week, I'm watching CNN. Now, I watch clips here and there now and then on, on the internet mm -hmm. because I'm interested in what's going on in the news. Uh, but but to, to put, on, put on those shows 24-7, that's just not mentally healthy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mm. so entertaining to watch mm. Don Lemon come mm. on and cry every well, night. How, how much can you do? A, this couple, is not a couple of days, but can you, do you have to do it every day? It's unprecedented. Ah. What Donald Trump said today, it's disgusting. It's awful. It's terrible. He is the president. President of the United States. <laughs> States. <laughs> like they can barely get the words out. They can't believe it. And it's all focused on what he says, not what he does. And it's all unprecedented. It's never been had. Uh, never. Listen, again, I want to remind you, Lyndon Johnson called, they just, Ju called they, Jewish people kikes. They just did it privately. They, well, didn't, yeah. they didn't do it in front of cameras like Donald Trump Donald, does. Listen, the one thing you can say about Donald Trump, love him or hate him, the guy, it's, it, it's impossible for the guy to be dishonest. He says mm. what's ever off the top of his head when he's thinking about it. Mm. He blurts it out without thinking. It, it's a bad thing in a lot of ways, but it's also a good thing in a lot of ways. I want to know what my president's yeah, thinking. He's not, he doesn't act like a politician He, in that he doesn't respect. come out with a facade and carefully choose every word, no. and he doesn't talk code to the base. <laughs> right? He's not talking code to anything. I watch CNN all day. Donald Trump said this. We all know that's code for the base. No, that's just what was over the top of his friggin' head. I, mean, they, I don't think the guy's capable of understanding a code. If he had a code, oh. he'd be talking about codes. What do you think he come on, he'd do a code discussion for two hours on, on Twitter. What do you think of Woodward's new book? Um, I think it's interesting that the guy who lied about Nixon is now lying about Trump. You think he's lying? Yeah, absolutely. Of course he's lying. Yeah. But I want to see, see somebody in the media do a story... A book, just like they did about Donald Trump, only about the people who work at CNN. Investigate their background, talk to their co-workers, and mm -hmm. then do an expose on CNN and all the people, Anderson Cooper and Wolf Blitzer and all the rest of them, Club Girl, right? We want a book about them, and we want to see if they have the same attitude when that mm -hmm. book comes out with all these anonymous sources and anonymous mm -hmm. quotes and nobody knows who really said anything, and see if they really think that that's patriotic. We want, that's what we want to see. Right? Uh, oh. That should be funny. All right. We've got some election results I want to talk about. We've got about 10 minutes left. Right, Ed Sullivan? Am I right about that? No, you're backwards. Mm -hmm. We're at one hour and eight minutes. We have oh, we minutes. are. Less yeah, than yeah. two minutes. All right. right well, let's just end the show. Um, <laughs> you, can pick up, you can pick up the Valley Patriot. Let's just end it. <laughs> you can pick up the Valley Patriot uh, starting probably tomorrow morning or this afternoon. September edition. We talked about a lot about the Methuen corruption, the scandals in Methuen, the superintendent who had no license. Um, we now find out that there's at least two more people in City Hall that have no license. We'll be breaking those stories in the next, uh, maybe today or tomorrow. Paul, tell everybody who you are and what you do. What is my name, real name and what do I really do? I am, um, I have a radio show beneath the surface. You can listen to us Monday evenings, 10 to 11 on WCAP. I teach college and I do a whole bunch of other stuff. All right. Kim. All right. Anderson needs a kidney, and if you know anybody that might be interested in donating a kidney, you can email her at kimkidney1960 at gmail.com. We will see you next week here on Paying Attention. Thank you. By the way, we just got our, our ratings, 72,000 downloads for Paying Attention. Phenomenal. 
So we want to thank all of our listeners, all the people who download us on Spotify and iHeartRadio and all that. I think that's Melvin Taylor saying we got to go home. Yeah, that's what he said. So go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.